really, I thought I'd try to, in the next 17 minutes exactly, set the table a little bit for the talks that are going to follow and just provide a bit of a broad overview, at least as I see it, of the, uh, of the heart failure state and, and what it's all about. And that will encompass, as, as the objective state, uh, what, uh, um, what the diagnosis is, how common it is. These are my uh, disclosures. So I'd like to identify those patients for you that I think are most at risk for heart failure along the continuum of the heart failure uh, trajectory. And then I identify and, and recognize common heart failure manifestations and ultimately identify targets for intervention and, and prevention. And, and that'll be the crux of my, my summary slide. So you've already seen this as it's floating up. I, I borrowed this slide from Heather Ross, my colleague at uh, PMCC, but uh, you've seen this slide in the background. Heart failure in Canada, rough numbers. About a million people are living with heart failure in our, in our country. And the even more staggering statistic is that right now, uh, if you're over 40 years of age, you've got a 20% chance of developing heart failure yourself. So one in five people uh, will develop heart failure if they live long enough. And it means it's impossible not to be touched by the disease uh, directly or indirectly. And there are hundreds of thousands of hospitalizations for heart failure in the country every year to the tune of about a 10-day admission per event. So if you get admitted with heart failure, that's 10 days of hospitalization uh, on average. And, uh, and obviously the resources that are required to manage that are very intensive, billions of dollars. And unfortunately, despite advances, once you're admitted to hospital with heart failure, you're looking on average, at a population level at least, of a, of a very poor prognosis, about a 2.1 median survival. And it's helpful and, and instructive, I think, to think about the continuum of heart failure uh, by stages. And this is something that came out of the American Heart Association years ago, but, uh, but it is helpful and we can get a bit granular in each of the stages. So uh, we recognize that there are stage A or patients with risk factors for the disease, uh, patients who have manifest structural heart disease, these are patients that have had their myocardial infarction. Then there are patients that develop stage C or symptomatic disease. And then the patients that many of us see in the advanced heart failure program with refractory or stage D heart failure. Most of us learn in, uh, when we're training about uh, the NYHA, New York Heart Association functional class. This is a very dynamic construct that really reflects how, how symptomatic patients are are doing and certainly in the advanced stages of heart failure the rule is that patients are living with very debilitating symptoms and disability and then when you're on the hospitalization side of things we sometimes think about how bad the patient is in terms of their hemodynamic profile how hemodynamically perturbed or embarrassed are they and, and are they crashing and burning are they in critical cardiogenic shock are they stuck on inotropes to keep their heart going and their circulating is circulation functioning and do we need to think about pulling the trigger for mechanical support, left ventricular cyst devices, transplant, or, or most commonly, palliative care. And of course, this relates to prognosis. And this is a, an interesting slide uh, that comes out of the Mayo Clinic that really turned the light on for me a number of years ago. And that's to say that we don't know the denominator of people walking around out there with structural heart disease that are at uh, imminent risk of developing symptoms. And that's important. It's important that we don't know it, but it's important to recognize that when things change, when people develop symptoms of heart failure, the game changes, and you're looking at about a five-fold increase in mortality from that point on. And we don't know the rate of conversion from asymptomatic to symptomatic patients, because if you're not symptomatic, you don't seek medical attention. You may, you may, not, you may not be um, aware of, uh, of the diagnosis. So once you have heart failure, what does it look like? Well, it's an even split between men and women. It tends to be a disease of older adults and the, the median age 20 years ago, 10 years ago, in mid to late 70s. And their usual suspects uh, cluster of comorbidities. So uh, hypertension, diabetes, chronic lung disease, atrial fibrillation, uh, multiple comorbidities. You can index that with the Charleston Comorbidity Index. These are common comorbidities. And it begs the question is, uh, as to whether we can intervene at these, uh, with respect to these comorbidities or risk factors to change the trajectory of the, uh, of the disease. And this is, this is not a new concept. I think it's well described in the hypertension literature. If you go back uh, decades, uh, 
uh, there's a pretty clear signal that if you treat heart failure, or sorry, if you treat hypertension, you can reduce incident heart failure. And that's a powerful reduction. Even in early hypertension studies, systematic reviews would suggest that by any treatment compared to no treatment for hypertension, you can cut the risk of heart failure by about 50%. So that's, that's powerful stuff and, and a first signpost of intervention. Um, I don't want to steal the thunder from the speakers that are, are going to follow, and this is my only diabetes slide, but uh, there is no hotter topic in the field of heart failure right now than, than diabetes and heart failure. And that really came out of some of the new therapies, particularly the SGLT inhibitors uh, for diabetic patients. Uh, the EMPA-REG uh, trial was a, was a huge shining light in this area that really suggested for the first time that diabetic patients had very high risk for heart failure. Um, you could prevent the onset of, of heart failure uh, symptoms and, and decompensation with a diabetic treatment. And so this is a, a very uh, uh, active area of research and, and uh, cause for some optimism. What about uh, preventing heart failure for screening? I mentioned that we don't know how many people are truly at risk and whether they're at risk of imminently decompensating. Um, so this is, there's a small and emerging literature around this. There's something called the STOP HF trial a few years ago now. And it was pretty neat because it, it was ambitious. It took about 1,300 patients with risk factors for, uh, for uh, cardiovascular disease and heart failure and screened with natriuretic peptides, which are biomarkers. And patients with uh, low-level elevations of biomarkers, so just above the threshold for completely normal, were screened with an echocardiogram, referred to a specialist. And in the BNP biomarker screened group, there were more interventions, more application of renin-angiotensin-aldosterone, blockade, presumably better treatment of risk factors and blood pressure, and less, less ultimate left ventricular dysfunction and heart failure events. So this is to say that if you can identify the sweet spot, the right patients uh, for screening for heart failure, um, perhaps you can avoid that transition from stage B to stage C disease. So once you have symptoms, once you have heart failure, symptoms and the diagnosis, uh, can you change the natural history? And, and I think it's helpful to know what you're up against, and, and that speaks to the classification schemes that we use in heart failure, the etiology, of course. And it's helpful to understand the patient's ongoing risk. How do they respond to therapy? And uh, what are their related uh, cardiac and non-cardiac uh, comorbidities? So for your consideration, uh, this is a 70-year-old uh, female with a history of hypertension and smoking, and she's on an uh, uh, amlodipine. Uh, she's got some uh, shortness of breath, she's unable to sleep, she's got some abdominal bloating, and her exam is consistent indeed with fluid overload and, and uh, congestive heart failure. Her ECG shows a left bundle branch blocker, which is very common in these patients. She's got a uh, chest x-ray that's congruent with her physical exam, and she's got natriuretic peptides, BNP levels that are unequivocally elevated, suggesting she indeed has heart failure. And her echo shows that the valves are normal, but the ejection fraction is 35%. So the question then uh, to frame things is, is, how would this heart failure syndrome be classified and what further workup is needed? Well, we learned different classification schemes that, because it helps us understand the physiology, right versus left heart failure, high output versus low output, systolic versus diastolic dysfunction, chronic versus acute versus advanced. And these are helpful understanding, again, mechanisms helpful for understanding how we target our interventions, but, but ultra-practically, uh, when we're looking at medical treatment anyway, it's very, it's very important to know whether the patient has reduced ejection fraction, we call it HEF-REF, or heart failure with reduced EF, versus heart failure with preserved uh, ejection fraction, where the EF is preserved over 50%, but the heart failure syndrome is still uh, clear and unequivocal, and then there's the mid-range patients just to make life even more complicated and give people something to talk about. But uh, roughly half of all patients are, are HEF-REF, reduced EF uh, patients. When we're talking about etiology, this is guidance from the Canadian Cardiovascular Society. This is a bit of a daunting slide, particularly if you're in primary care and you have undifferentiated heart failure patients in front of you. There, there are, of course, some routine uh, blood work investigations, imaging tests you would do. But I just want to blow this up and, and focus on the most common elements of this. I think it is critically important to recognize that coronary artery disease is still drives anywhere from half to three quarters of, uh, of heart failure in terms of etiology. So you look for hypertensive heart disease, coronary disease, and then if it's not that, 
it's probably something less common, and then you've got to go down uh, and, and tuck into the investigations with a little bit more uh, rigor and, uh, and often uh, trigger a referral to a specialist. Uh, sorry that this uh, graphic got cut off, but really this is a guideline approach to improving outcomes with the reduced ejection fraction population. So practically, if you know that the ejection fraction is less than 40%, we've got things that we can offer that will change the natural history of disease. We know that um, we want to employ neurohormonal blockade, ACE inhibitors, and uh, mineralocorticoid antagonists, uh, beta blockers, reassess symptoms, and then think about more novel therapies, substituting the ACE inhibitor for secubitril valsartan, which is a more potent therapy, adding evabradine, which, is, which can slow the sinus rate down. So we've got a, a menu of options medically to try and improve prognosis and improve symptoms along the trajectory of, of illness. So again, more guidance from the Canadian Cardiovascular Society. And why is medical therapy so important? Uh, one of the reasons it's important, other than it does translate into mortality benefits, is that about a, a quarter of patients with a reduced ejection fraction on good medical therapy over time will improve their ejection fraction into that mid-range or even higher level. In other words, medical therapy can help, at least at a population level, improve the ejection fraction over time, which is tied to prognosis. So then along the journey, we recognize that people can have chronic stable, pseudo-stable heart failure. How do we identify those patients that are at risk of further decompensating or ending up again in hospital? And we recognize that by the time you end up with symptoms and hospitalization, there's been a cascade of things and there's been a, a long pre-symptomatic phase for days and days, sometimes weeks and weeks, where patients are physiologically deranged, retaining fluid, and so it stands to reason that if we can prevent that from happening, if we have ways to monitor patients and prevent uh, physiologic worsening and symptom onset, we can keep people out of hospital and uh, make them uh, potentially live longer. And we do have new technologies of invasively and non-invasively monitoring patients outside of the office to prevent these decompensations. And there are whole symposia on remote monitoring technologies, what works and how to apply what works to change outcomes. And then finally, can we identify patients who are progressively declining? We know that in any individual's journey will look something like this. There'll be periods of stability, and then a lot of periods of high medical encounters, uh, high, high usage of uh, healthcare resources towards the palliative or advanced stages of disease, for which we wonder if we can rescue some of these patients with advanced therapies. The trouble with this is that it's hard to do at an individual level. Every patient will be on this journey one way or another, but we don't know when and how and in whom. So, so that is what we're trying to refine in our thinking. So just again, the possibility of refining our understanding of prognosis, a 78-year-old man with a prior myocardial infarction with severe symptoms, um, he's on good medical therapy, his blood pressure is a little soft as you can see there, he's got some evidence of fluid overload, his creatinine is elevated at 188, his ejection fraction is 25%. So what is this patient's one-year mortality? This is like most of the patients we see that end up uh, in and out of hospital. Well, guidance from the Canadian Cardiovascular Society would say, we've got a lot of risk scores you could look at. Um, and this is daunting and overwhelming. You don't have to know them all. But what they all have in common is some, is some key features that would suggest that if you're older, if you have more disability and symptoms, bad kidneys, deranged biomarkers, your prognosis is probably uh, going to be poor. And when you plug this patient's data into one of those scores, you get a range in, in, in mortality, one-year mortality estimate about 30 to 40 percent. That's staggering and, and certainly more morbid than most cancer diagnoses at any one time. So I think risk scores can be helpful in identifying the highest risk patients who are transitioning in their stage of disease, can frame discussions about goals and wishes, and can be useful adjunct to facilitate timing of referral for, for advanced therapies. And so this is my uh, uh, second last slide, and, and it really summarizes what I was hoping to, to cover in, in the 17 minutes. So there's a vulnerability along the disease uh, trajectory, and we recognize that patients go from an at-risk state to the onset of symptoms and heart failure, which have said is associated with a many-fold increase in, in mortality, episodes of worsening, transition of care from, from hospital to home, into the ambulatory clinic and ultimately to the advanced heart failure uh, 
state. So I think we can legitimately and uh, be driven to think about uh, how we prevent this from happening. Aggressive treatment of risk factors, including hypertension, appropriate treatment of diabetes, underlying coronary disease. Um, with the onset of heart failure, sorry, we want to initiate titrate and follow the response to guideline-directed uh, medical therapy because it does, it does impact. It makes a difference in, in uh, survival and uh, function. We want to care for these patients between office visits. So most of, the, most of a patient's life is not in your office. Most of their life is their life. And so how do we keep them well in, those, in, in that intercurrent space and, and between uh, healthcare contacts? And this whole enterprise of remote monitoring has a lot of promise in, in this regard. And then ultimately, uh, can we recognize the high-risk patients and modify, be responsive to that, modify our intensity of uh, follow-up and potentially intervention for the patients that are at highest risk. And that's where, again, risk scores can help and trigger opportunities to, uh, to refer. And finally, uh, refer for advanced therapies. When you recognize the patient is, is uh, facing a very poor one-year prognosis, um, and maybe those advanced therapies take the form of palliative care. For, for occasional patients, they may take the form of experimental therapies, left ventricular assist device support, uh, cardiac transplantation. But for many patients, it's just augmentation of medical therapy and, uh, and good palliative care. So in summary, uh, I would say that heart this, I read this first bullet is a mouthful, but it's true. Heart failure is a prevalent, chronic, fluctuating, highly morbid, resource-intensive patient and public health condition. I think the different classification schemes are helpful to identify the right interventions for the right patients, and many interventions exist. We need to create a system of care to navigate patients through and deliver it at the right time. So with that, I'll, I'll end and, and have a seat. Thank you very much.